Hello and welcome to Radio Write Off. I'm Cool Scratch. I'm Zoe. And, and this is the podcast that we yeah. haven't done for like five months. Oh dear God, it's been a long time, hasn't it? Yeah. Oh my uh, God, there's a dog that looks like a bear. Sorry, okay, wow. I got sidetracked. Wow. It looks like a bear. I thought it was a bear. One of my friends lives in Macedonia and apparently they have dogs literally the size of bears there. It's terrifying. I wouldn't say this. It was a, you know, it was the size. It looked like a, a golden retriever or something, but but it looked like a bear. Bears are it's, pretty. It it scared me a little, but um, I know that we said we're going to try and keep this more focused than we did last time, and we're already succeeding. Like when we talked about start recursion, which is a story that has not like been in the write off for almost a year now, and we spent about half the podcast talking about it. So. Thank God Dubs isn't here, or that would have started us all off again. Um, speaking of speaking of Dubs, he's not here anymore. He died. Um, still waiting for that bus <laughs> bus stop. He's his corpse is sitting there at the stop. But uh, but no, he's too busy. He couldn't make it this time. He's probably not going to make any other one. So for now, it's just me and Quill. So we're just going to go ahead with with what we're talking about. And this this write off event is the end of an era, which I think is quite appropriate for. The end of our era together with dubs. And the end of our era of doing jack shit with this podcast. Oh, also that. Hopefully this will be a good kick for us to get going. Uh, I'm going to try and get it started again as a regular thing and not once every half a year. Yeah, that would be better than nothing, wouldn't it? Probably. We had a few things we wanted to talk about this round before we got into the nitty gritty of individual stories. And I think one thing that came up in our discussions a lot... Um, was prompt usage wasn't it zoe um yeah well prompt not necessarily prompt usage but how how we factor the usage of the prompt into how we grade stories when we rank them um because i noticed on solitude for the modern business where there were a couple people saying that because they couldn't see how it connected to the prompt that they knocked it down on their slate which i think is absolute bullshit um mostly because i guess this has to do with how i view like what the prompt is for I just view the prompt as just a starting off point and not like a very rigid guideline that you have to stick to or else you get points knocked off. Yeah, I, on a lot of points there, I would agree with you, Zoe, because I think, I think the prompt's original inclusion is an attempt to make sure that that um, time of writing rule is stuck to, that we don't s- start writing in advance and obviously there are ways to get around that. You can write a bunch of stories and you see one that sort of kind of fits the prompt, so you can submit that. Of course there are ways to get around it. But the right, write-off right. has always operated on this sense of trust and honesty. And, you know, yeah. giving people the benefit of the doubt. And I think that's something that really should carry over to the way we treat prompt usage. I found Solitude so far, I've read almost all of the finals fix at this stage myself. I know you've read I, all I've of them. read all, yeah. Um, Solitude was the first I read of them, and it remains my favourite so far. Um, oh yeah, definitely. I'll be honest. I, it's definitely my top one. And I was really interested in the way that the author did in fact use the prompt to get to that idea. And I thought, you know, to say, to say that that isn't okay just because you think it's a bit tenuous sort of doesn't really work yeah. with the idea of a prompt at all. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I think that's, that's too, I think, like, doing that is way too rigid of an interpretation of what the prompt is supposed to be, because I think it's just a starting off point. I don't think it's supposed to be, like, a written guideline that you have to follow or else, because I, I think that, one, misinterprets what the prompt is for, and two, it, um, I think it incentivizes authors to do something that they shouldn't do, and that's make concessions with their story to maybe get a couple more points. I, I think that just quite simply kills a lot of creativity. Um, yeah, I agree. If, if you're afraid that you're going to get a couple points knocked off because you because you can see how people will think that your story won't fit the prompt and you're afraid they're going to knock a couple points off, you're going to maybe make a worse story. Um, and I don't want to see that happen because of the prompt. I I agree with you wholeheartedly on that one. And I don't want to be calling people out for, you know, saying things aren't okay because they yeah, I mean, fit the prompt. It's fine. If you if that's how you think the rules should be interpreted, again, we have this freedom yeah, yeah. of interpretation. Um, I, I can't, I don't think, I, I can't force anyone to vote a certain way, nor do I think I should be forcing anyone to vote a certain way. That's just, I think it's it kind of goes against the spirit of the write-off to 
to have such a rigid view of what the prompt means, if that makes sense. Yeah, we're not trying to influence the way you vote strictly. We just want to have you consider a few different yeah, ideas. Con- I consider consider the following. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's that's the way we wanted to take this. So sorry if that did come across as a bit of an attack. It wasn't meant to. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> I'll attack anyone if they, if they come at me. I'll, I'll fight. Now, having talked a bit about prompt interpretation uh, in respects to voting, should we talk a bit about the prompt itself? Uh, yeah, I, I thought this prompt is really, really good. Um, I mean, I, I liked it. I thought it was a, an example of a really good prompt. It's open. It's like it's this nice mix of open ended and specific at the same time, if that makes sense. Like end yes. of an era. If, if you think about it, that just means like change. Um, which can fit a lot of things. I mean, that's where a lot of stories start is something changing. But at the same time, calling something the end of an era means that it's a specific, very big, prominent, significant change. Not just like, I changed the oil in my car. It's a new era of having different oil. It's it's a much bigger change than that. Which I and, does play into, you know, the whole storytelling idea. Like, we right. do... Stories are about change, fundamentally. Yeah. And I think... Um, it, this prompt doesn't really force very much onto the writer beyond making that change more visible to the reader. Yeah, I, I think what this what this prompt ultimately like seemed to inspire to me was think bigger. Um, instead yeah. of going with maybe small changes, think of something that you could define as an era. Um, and there's a lot of examples of, of this popping up in the stories, like Solitude. It's the end of an era of loneliness and spending your your Valentine's Day alone. It's and um, I thought that was good enough. I like that. Going back to that story, mm-hmm. that was I, I I really like the way that story dealt with it as well. Um, but then you got uh, stories like I'm genuinely surprised how many um, humorous stories have made the finals this round. Um, yeah, it's, it's it did seem like more one. comedy than normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotta yeah. catch at least one has a brilliant way, and it, like it almost in two ways talks about ending eras. In one sort of the way that uh, Luna is ending her time at the school, but also sort of that you get that sense of change in the real world at the moment with the whole Pokemon Go craze coming, right? And sort of tying that to the idea of an rather than looking at that as a new beginning, looking at that as an ending. I think sure. you know that is a really interesting way of looking at it, and yeah. tying that to the prompt. I know that's probably a lot more than the story itself actually goes into, but you know. That I still that was I think that it's either that or Concubine are my favorite comedy this round. Mm, they were both very very good stories. They're they're both in the in the top half of my slate. I think I don't have my slate pulled up right now, especially because I'm probably gonna fuck around with it a little bit before voting ends. But those are both definitely in the top half. Talking of Concubine, there was something uh, someone said in the comments. I'm just pulling it up now. Um, I think I don't want to accidentally attribute this to the wrong person. That's why I'm checking it now. Uh, who was it? Someone said something about how the ideal uh, reader for this fic. I'm pretty sure someone said this, and I've lost it now. Hold on, I'm gonna have to control F. It's all right. I got plenty of more sidewalk ahead of me. Here we go. It was Bad Horse. Um, Bad Horse wrote the idea of an ideal reader for this fic being someone who was raised in a civilization that didn't have 2,000 years of Christianity, um, which I thought was a really interesting point. The concubine, in a sense, does play off uh, juxtaposing the sort of uh, bawdy humour with the more gentle ending that the fic has. Yeah, well, Um, I... I know in my notes for the story, I, I really appreciated how it, it seemed to hit a really nice balance of sexual comedy and heartwarmingness at the same time. Because it plays the fact that the, I mean, concubines and harems don't really exist in, in Equestria anymore, at least in the mm. time of the story. But, I mean, Luna's still going out there like they're, like everyone's fucking all the time. And so it, it opens up the door for a lot of sexual situations, which are pretty funny. But it also finds a way to tie it into a, a heartwarming lesson about, you know, how relationships have changed and why they're good and why people like to be in relationships in the first place. Yeah. And, and I, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it worked really well. A lot of people in the reviews are talking about how 
there's almost a juxtaposition between those two things. Um, and I think Bad Horse has really hit the nail on the head that there doesn't actually have to be one. And I think the story doesn't present it as a juxtaposition. It doesn't present it as two conflicting ideas at all. Um, but rather says, look, these two ideas can be side by side. And in fact, often are. Right. Um, and I, I like the way that it does that. I think it's, it makes the story a lot smoother and a lot more natural to read. Yeah, I, I thought it, I, I guess we can tone it down, or not tone it down, but say it handled its subject matter very, very well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I think, I think Concubine's in my top five, I think. Okay, it's, it's, it's definitely top. one of my favorites, although the corrections to um, early modern English are, of course, important to remember. Of course. Because I I yeah. didn't even notice that those were errors until I saw in the comments thread that people were talking about it. They were my only complaint while I was reading it through to myself, um, which which says a lot actually. When the only thing you haven't mastered about your story is early modern English, um, I think you're doing pretty well. Yeah, I mean it's such a niche thing. Like, I don't think the average reader is going to really notice that much. I know for a fact I didn't. Um, hmm. Because yeah. I guess I've, I've always been to the opinion that the primary purpose of language is to convey meaning. And if you're doing that, then you're doing it right. And there's not much that needs to be changed. But, well, that's, but that's just me. And I, I think there are a lot of people who would take your view on that. I think it's just that we happen to have a group of very nitpicky people in the write-off. Very nitpicky people. And there's not that that's a bad that thing. Um, all right. Yeah, so we what's, seem to have what's next on the... talking about the stories, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, we plan this for a little bit later. Um, what's next? I think we said most controversial is the next one. Do we even have anything that we like disagree about? I, I don't really know. Um... List. Okay, here's what we'll do. List all of your controversial opinions about things in this write-off, and I'll tell you if I agree or not. I think gotta catch at least one genuinely i don't think missed a single beat a lot of people in the reviews were saying that you know some of the choices for the comedy maybe weren't the best and i fundamentally disagree i think it has not only chosen I, the I right characters you. but i think it's presented them in exactly the right order because when your second example is something as stupid as gummy you know you're setting yourself up for a set of brilliant examples to follow and it hey, does I, I agree with you the running jokes are fantastic they reminded me of like Phineas and Ferb if you've like ever seen that it's a kids show it's really good and they they do a lot from running jokes and they they vary them just enough that they feel fresh but they're still familiar mm. I, I loved Maud's poetry in this one I have to admit yeah that, I was literally especially she's rolling like, out she's of like, my chair it's like please don't read this to me yeah and then it and like adding on to that after that like i'm literally falling out of my chair with laughter at this point and adding on after that the repetition of the pinky pie please come remove x from my office you know it was was a stroke of genius i loved it so i'm a bit quiet there's a black cat here it's eyeing me a little bit i gotta be slow so that this shit terrifying. doesn't go after me i think i'm past it looking behind me it's still looking at me how you doing oh he's sitting down all right we're good all right, we're safe. But no, I agree with you. Do you have any other okay. controversial or vitriolic um, opinions? Other controversial opinions? I don't really know. I think... Um, which one was it? Was it Fire in the Promised Land? I know there's been a lot of talk about it. Yeah, it's Fire in the Promised Land. There's been an awful lot of talk about this one. Um, and a lot of people... I, I haven't really picked up on the whole lot of talk, but people seem to be really quite liking it um yeah it's i know i know for a fact it's second on my slate i really like that one i struggled with fire in the promised land i'll be perfectly honest with you and i all right so here's here's our disagreement here's, our, here's controversial. our disagreement and i'm not gonna go out and say it's bad because it's not it is a really really good story and it's told really well and by the end i was absolutely involved and really quite emotionally attached to that ending that ending was right. brilliant mm -hmm. but and I have to say this, I would not have got to that end if I hadn't been reading it for the write-off, because I knew I needed to give an opinion on it. Okay. The So the reason I, I managed to get through the end, be, like, totally on my own, because I was invested, 
not because I, not even necessarily because I like cared for the character or anything like that, but the descriptions painted such a vivid picture in my head that I wanted to see how the rest of it was going to play out. Hmm. I agree. The, the imagery is fantastic. I just felt that, like, just the opening, just, if you, if you open it up in a tab, having not read it at all before, and you just look at it, I mean, who was, I don't know if it was on this particular story, but I think Mr. Numbers commented, um, a fantastic fact. No, it wasn't on this story. About how, um, and I am going to say this is definitely Mr. Numbers' fact, not mine. I know, no, I have no idea where this comes from. The idea is that um, for every line beyond the fifth in a paragraph, um, significantly decreases the number of readers who are going to read past the second. That I can see. Long paragraphs are really daunting, and when you have a whole bunch of them after each other, one after the other after the other, and then you scroll down a bit further, and I have a huge screen, and two paragraphs alone almost fill it up. Right. That's daunting to a reader. And oh yeah, definitely. That I agree on. And I'm not going to say it's it's not a bad fic, because it isn't. It's a fantastic fic, but I really think... It's gorgeously written. It needs an easier introduction. I think honestly, even I, I, I can't pull up it. I can't pull it up right now, so I, I don't know how quite big the paragraphs are. But Fair. from what you tell me, it sounds like even if they just put a couple of line breaks here and there, it'd be much oh, better. Just, even just because a it has more line of one line paragraphs, you know, right. um, yeah. something to break just it up, br- just break up that yeah, wall up of text. Then... Because we don't really get short paragraphs until the dialogue starts, and that's not right. Three or four screens down. <laughs> maybe two i might be scrolling right. a bit fast yeah i can so, see yeah. that i mean that, still, that's my gorgeously, mildly gorgeously controversial opinion story. it is a gorgeously written story all the ones i've read so far in the final are i think um Mo- yeah really I, I think well, really well done i think they're all well written what what made it or broke it for me in this round was what it did with this idea or how it how it uh expressed what it was trying to say um because i think all of them are I think all of them were pretty solid on the writing front. Just some of them interested me more than others. Like uh, Fairy Tale, yeah. or Fairy Tales. It's second last on my slate because I just did not find what it was saying interesting at all. I could not I get into that story. I probably, I probably really interesting to begin from it. with. And then I think. Yes, my I, interest I dropped loved off what it was doing. Time. I love what it was doing with handles and the mm. handkerchiefs and things like that. That fast, I love that. But what it actually went with after that was was just boring to me. I felt like I had read it before. Even though I hadn't read it before, it felt so familiar to me and that it wasn't doing much with its idea. I mean, they name dropped H.G. Wells pretty significantly and never do anything with the fact that it's H.G. Wells. Precisely. You know? I think that's a huge... That is an it could issue. Be, it could be H.G. Wells, or it could be it could be me, or it could be like John Smith, and you would lose absolutely nothing. There's no point for it to be H.G. Wells. And I'm just yeah. waiting. Is it? Are you going to do anything with this being H.G. Wells, or is this just going to be he's that guy? Oh, it's it's H.G. Yeah. Wells. I have name recognition. It it feels like fan service almost. You know, right. um, yeah, just a little which, bit. Yeah, yeah. Another thing, like, I loved the switch from Twilight's to Celestia's perspective at the start, um, as we go from chapter Those are done well. I like... But there's no more shifts after that. And I was kind of expecting one. I don't know how anyone else felt about that, but I I really expected another shift. They definitely helped break up the, um... I don't want to say monotony, but it helped break up the, the going in the past and going in the future by directly tying it into what was going on mm. in the i do think some of the chapter breaks were unnecessary um i thought i i personally didn't even understand why it was in chapters in the first place it's not super important to me but um i will say that i wasn't quite sure why i was seeing chapter breaks yeah it's a very interesting perspective given we i mean it's the only place well it's one of the few places they seem to use hard scene breaks apart from occasional interruptions from twilight um, right. I I honestly think you cut yeah. up the chapter titles and you lose absolutely nothing. But um, agreed. Um, I mean, some of them. But are that's that's honestly a nitpick. But... It, it didn't take me out of the story that much. No, I just wondered why it had happened. Sometimes. Um, where 
what I want to say, going off of uh, scene breaks, where it did take me out was in, um, what was it? Historical. I can't remember what it's called. Historical it's historical gaps. Historical I gaps. Read that historical one, yeah. gaps. That's it. That one, I, I won't spoil it, but that one jumps from the past to the present too. But the, the mm. jumps to the present seem entirely unnecessary, and they brought me out of the story while I was reading it, because all the interesting stuff happens in the past. The stuff that's going on in the present isn't that interesting to me. And so okay. when I was seeing the present stuff, I was just like, I don't really, I don't really see how this fits in. And it, those those jumps felt unnecessary. If that story was told entirely in the past tense, it would probably actually gain quite a bit because you cut some of the crap. Hmm. I I can understand that. I do think sometimes time jumps they can they can make a really interesting framing device, but unless you actually tie that to a to something that's yeah, meaningful in the story, it's not gonna right. do anything more than frame the story. I mean, I understand why historical gaps started in the present. Why it started in the present and that was fine. But once the story goes on and it continues jumping from the past to the present, it's it's unnecessary. It just feels like reminding you, hey, there's stuff going on in the present. When there's not much going on in the present at all. Yeah. But... So so that that was just more taking me out of the story than actually adding any new information. Yeah, for the author of, of that story, I don't know if you've read it, but um I just want to briefly recommend a book. Um, it's Turn of the Screw by Henry James. Uh, it's a fairly short book. It uses this structure of starting uh, in one time and jumping back into another, in fact, to an entirely different narrator, um, and then doesn't reference that initial framing story at all again. Um, and I think the way that James does that in that book is definitely worth taking a look at if if more than just uh, more than just so you're complaining about this it's something you might want to look into no let me complain <laughs> why enough. why else am i talking into my phone right now if not to complain about stories well we could also guess authors i suppose since that's, that's next a, on our agenda that's a, i have to give you credit that's a good that's a good ass segue there's a I admit, I'm absolutely barking. terrible at it um <laughs> I genuinely I like have that. never successfully guessed an author at the right off. That is a dog. There's multiple dogs. There's like three That's... of them. Wow. All right, author guessing. I, I author guessing. I have to admit, I don't author guess very much at all because I usually don't care very much about like who wrote what until after. But there are a couple of stories here that I did want to say. I think "Gotta Catch at Least One" is written by the letter J. It feels okay. It it felt like a Hayes story at first. It felt like Hayes wrote it, but then I, I checked the the things and I saw Hayes is not actually in the finals. Hmm. So I was like, all right, then then Jay, I could see Jay writing this because it feels like something Jay would write. Yeah, because it yeah. feels like something Jay would read and enjoy, and that's what I'm basing that off. It feels like something Jay would like, which makes me think that Jay wrote it. Okay. Um. But outside of that, there's there's really nothing I feel very strongly on with author guessing. I'm going to throw in a guess, um, because someone has to, um, for and I'm actually going to mark this now on my author guessing so that it can be forever marked as Quill got this wrong, immortalized, uh, <laughs> but a I'm, monument to your failure. I'm actually going to guess the Yo Mama mandate, um, which I. You know, it was I raged at a bit. Um, anyone who was in the Discord Just chat when I finished reading I, that I, will have noticed. I, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting the joke at the end, but it got a pretty big laugh out of me because I was not expecting that. I was just like sitting there going, "I cannot believe this was a fake hood." Like I, I knew it. it was going to be a fake hood because it's let's a good be honest, one. Well, it's a I'm fake glad... called the Yo Mama Mandate. <laughs> I'm glad that it, I, I'm glad that it wasn't just like a simple pun. I'm glad that it was actually like a joke. Yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm gonna throw in a guess for that as Chico, because um, as who? For Chico. Psycho. Oh. Yeah. How is it? yeah. There's I've, two I've E's. How else are you gonna pronounce that? I've always pronounced it Psycho. 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 Um, okay. Because memes. Um. But yeah, I'm gonna throw in throw in that as my guess because. Yeah. If, I mean, if that sounds, I can agree on. with you on that. Come on. <laughs> 
I'm probably going to be totally wrong, but well, it's, I feel well, like it would be wrong of me not thought, to guess that. I also thought Psycho, or Seiko, if you're a plebe, uh, said, I thought he could have wrote, uh, gotta catch him, gotta catch at least one, two. Oh, I suppose. Which which means, on the flip side, I can definitely see Jay having written the Yo Mama mandate. So I'm... <laughs> So you can probably flip those around, and I'm going to count that as guessing for both of those, and I'm going to be right on at least one. Okay. I have to. <laughs> There's no way I can't be. When it turns gonna, out it I'm was... Gonna eat these when words it turns later. out it was cold, we're going to be when it, when it, so mad. When all the stories were written by Golden Gardez, I'm going to just eat my own hat. All of them. I don't even own any hats, and I'm going to eat them. I've actually just noticed we don't have any double finalists this round. We have exactly the no, same number I, of authors I counted as that it, final stories. Because when I was when I was making my guesses for this author guessing segment, I looked around and I was like, "All right, are there any doubles? Anything I should look out for?" No, one story a person. Very very well done, everyone. On not wait, no, that's not well done at all. <laughs> it makes it harder to guess because I have yeah. I have less less wiggle room. Agreed. So with that fiasco over, um. I think there was something we wanted to do, which was talk about honorable mentions. Uh, we've called them in our honorable little, mentions. A little not mock necessarily. Up of what we're talk about. I I gotta give a disclaimer here. Just, when I when I say honorable mentions, I think usually that means the ones who just barely, who like were close to getting finals but weren't. I haven't read all the stories, so I can't say if the the, the one story that I picked as an honorable mention should have been in finals or not. Mm. But it was, I'm, I'm more using honorable mentions to mean stories that didn't make finals, but I think still deserve recognition for, for being good. Yeah, agreed. I think that's definitely... Not necessarily that kind of ones that, that should have made it in the finals. Yeah, so do you want to just... go, you want to give your pick or mine? Uh, I can give my pick because I've, al- I've already told you what my pick is. Um... You've already told me what your pick is and I read it and I have some opinions on it. Not very strong ones, but oh. that still happens. Um, so my pick for honorable mentions is uh, "Shut Up" by Bad Horse, um, which I admit I originally only read because I saw "By Bad Horse" in the fix that didn't make the finals, um, and I I was curious. Bad Horse has a bit of a reputation, at least the way I see it. Um, so I gave it a read, and I was really quite surprised it hadn't made finals. Um, I really enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong; it, there are issues. There's issues Do with you everything. Hear that plane? It sounds. That plane I honestly up, can't tell what up. that is. <laughs> it's a plane. It's a. It's a, it's plane, a plane. That's like sounding like a tor- It's. It sounds like a tornado siren, but it's a plane. Are you sure it's not someone standing behind you whistling? <laughs> no, I just looked behind me. There's no one behind me. Sadly, I wish there had been something stalking me this entire time. Some dubs risen from the dead. Um, there's. I've been looking at the um, at the waveform of this recording. There's like cracks where it looks like I'm stepping where I'm stepping on branches. So uh, and it gets some sounds that some beautiful sounds in nature here on this podcast. A very natural podcast we've got going on here. And then there's me in my room. Um, I would have been in my room if my parents were home. They yell at me when I start talking too loud. So I have to take uh, a walk around a gorgeous neighborhood in 84 degree heat. Hurrah! I love nature. Anyway, um, I was I was simply going to say I really enjoyed Shut Up, and I felt you know um, I didn't. Okay, I I just felt that. But you you go ahead ways, first. I just wanted to say that. I I thought for me this is a fic. I haven't had the time to sit down and tear it apart the way I would love to, um, and I really would love to. I think if if Dubs were here, we could probably lose as much time on this story as we have talking about start recursion in the past well i would immediately i think there is that much in it (laughs) i couldn't even like get through i started skimming near the end because i was just like not interested at all in the story i I see do agree that is an issue it is not the most it's not the most invested story when, when, when you open up with quantum physics you're either going to like appeal to like nerds i call those nerds no, you're gonna you're gonna appeal to a very specific audience, and pretty much everyone else is gonna feel like, okay, I don't care about quantum physics. I'm one of those people who don't care about quantum physics very much. So mm. opening up with what was it, the Copenhagen interpretation? Yeah. it's called or something. Yeah. So I started yeah. reading that, and then just like the the narrative voice just was not for me. Um, 
So I, I really could not get through this thing. I might sit down and like force myself to read it, but do you really want to force yourself to read a story? Well, I have several like, times. But... <laughs> do you enjoy it? Sometimes. Sometimes I get to the All end right, of the story cool. and I go, I'm cool. really I'm, glad I'm I did that. To... I'm trying to make a point here, Quill. I need you to lie through your teeth for, for me to make this No, point. I have never enjoyed forcing myself to read a story apart from that one time I admitted I had earlier on this podcast. There you go. See? Was that so hard? No. But, um, yeah, just, just just was not for me. I can. It definitely has an audience, and I can, I, I can recognize that it does because people liked it, but I'm just not in that audience. That's fair. I think that's very fair. All right, then, you had your own suggestion for honorable mention. I mentions. do have my own suggestion. My honorable, my honorable mention is Cash's The Empty Throne. Okay. This was, this was by far my favorite that I read of the non-finalists, which wasn't all that many, but I'd imagine that there wouldn't be much that would knock it out. Because I really, really liked this story. Um, I, it was near... I probably would have put it near the top of my final. Did I mention... I feel like a piece of shit this round. I, I had my non-final slate right and i was gonna mm -hmm. try and read everything and vote on everything and then mm -hmm. i started reading started voting and i put two stories on my slate and uh, i never put any more on so when the rankings are released and you see that one slate that has only two stories on it you know that's me oh dear. i even i even know the two stories that i had were a new beginning and the stratosphere council so uh, those are going to be those little two, and I feel horrible for it. It's, this isn't even the first time it's happened. Dubs, Dubs called me out on it last time it happened because the same thing happened. I was going to do it later and then just totally ran out of time. I but, mean, I um, think it happens to all of us at some point. Uh, we mess it's, up it's and a rite of quite passage, get around honestly. to everything. It's a rite of passage. No, but um, if it were on my slate, it definitely would have been up there. I, I really loved this story. I know a lot of people said that the, the stakes didn't seem that high. Because, because if you haven't read it, the basic idea is that Luna has like just been banished, like fresh, like the ground is still smoldering from her being banished. And um, they, the nobles, or not maybe the nobles, but like Celestia's parliament wants to transfer all of Luna's like titles and everything to Celestia. And they want to make her queen instead of princess. And the, the conflict here is, is Celestia going to do that or not? And um, a lot of people said that they didn't like it because the stakes were kind of weird. That, like, it doesn't really matter who the titles go to, right? Which makes sense, but at the same time, it's, it's a symbolic move. You know, there aren't really any real, like, actual stakes with how the government's going to operate. It's pure symbolism. And I was, that worked for me. Mm. That didn't really drag me out of the, the conflict. Yeah, I can see. I can see how it works. I'm just skimming it now because I'm, I'm afraid this isn't one I've read. Um, it's it's a good story. It's it's like I said. I mean, it's my honorable mention. So yeah, I think there are but, a few points people have been making in the reviews that, you know, just from your description of what's going on, I, I understand why these complaints I mean, might it's, be there. I definitely understand it. It's just it just uh, that wasn't an issue for me, so I was able to enjoy the story no hold part. Yeah, I think it's Bad Horse has made a really good case here um, in a review for changing the chronology to be not immediately after uh, Luna's banishment. And I think just from what you've said there, I think um, there's something about having, you know, not having no time to react to that right. um, and being immediately forced into making I these mean, kinds of decisions you, doesn't you, really yeah. sound... You would think you know, everyone likely. would still be shell shocked, um, yeah. which I definitely see. I guess just my main point is that it's a mostly symbolic conflict, and for mm. some people, that's not going to work at all. But it did work for me. I I agree that the symbolic conflicts are good, and I think you know people who, who say they aren't can can go. Um, yeah, just go like the people who vote based on the prompt, huh? <laughs> I admit to having once voted based on a prompt, and I feel disgusting. For it. Disgusting. I've learned. I've learned since then. You're not about. You've grown as a person. You're not about that life anymore. Yes. Um. So I think all but that now, really comes down to it is saying which ones we think are going to win. Yeah. Our well, maybe not which. I mean, I I guess which ones are at the top of my slate. We were going to do like an actual organized top 10, but one, it's going to take too long, and two, our tastes vary just enough that we're not going to get anywhere with that. 
also out of so, 14 possible stories a top 10 is not yeah, really gonna be a top 10 is telling yeah. um so yeah so we're just gonna do like personal recommendations you want to go first you want me to go first uh i went first on the last one you go first this time all right so my my top stories this round in no particular order were solitude of or solitude for the minor business mayor uh, fire into promised land opals gemstones the list the list list stubbornness um those are those are my top three this round. Those I think were the best ones of this this round. I think you should go read them, and I hope they medal. I I from what I read of opals, it's probably not gonna medal because a lot of people said that it was a, a an idea that they had seen before because it's about the all the main six dying and what effect uh-huh. that has on the world, which is definitely something that's been done before, but it's not something that I had personally read before, even if I knew it existed. So that didn't take me out of it that much. I'm not, I'm not expecting it to medal because of that, because a lot of people find it cliched. But I still think that the execution of the story is absolutely fantastic and deserves uh, some, some special note. I think okay. you should go read that one. And that is one I actually that. haven't read, so I think I will go and read that as soon as we finish recording. Um, or maybe in the morning. I don't know, it's getting kind of late for me. Um, my top picks for this round... Uh, oh. It's a bit difficult. I know... I'm, I'm just going to come out and say it. Solitude is absolutely my top pick. Um, oh, mine too. 100%. I, it's at the top of my slate, and that's not going to yeah. change. I, I can't imagine. It was fantastic. It was genuinely fantastic. I, I, can't, I can't imagine a world in which it does not at least medal. Yeah, agreed. I I think... If it if it doesn't medal, I'll... all fix I haven't read are outstanding, I will be disappointed if Solitude does not medal. It's so good. It's such a good story. I know. Um, the but other your, ones, your picks. I think, the other ones I think were really good. Um, I think genuinely just on being a fantastically written comedy, and there were a lot of comedies to choose from this round, I, but I appreciated the structure, I appreciated um, the choicing, choices that were made in this fic so much more than the others i have to say gotta catch at least one is up there for me i don't think it's gonna meddle at all um comedies do tend to be ranked lower just in general because yeah there's this perception that they're easier to pull off right but i think it is an outstanding work of comedy and i know again comedy subjective people will disagree with me on that but i liked it yeah um the other one i'm gonna throw up there is one we haven't even discussed yet um but I am going to throw up Childhood, uh, Childhood's End. Childhood's End, right. I really enjoyed Childhood's End. Um, I, I enjoyed it up until the end. Um, but do you want to say why you liked it first, and then I'll hop in with with what yeah, kind of um, I thought it was led a, it for me? I thought it was really a nice, a really interesting take on the coming-of-age genre. I think it looked at that in a new way that was very clearly inspired by the prompt and i think the prompt did an awful lot of the work for this story and i i enjoy it when the prompt does a lot of work for a story when you can look at the prompt and go i see how this informed that i can see how ideas have come from this quite right. organically and it and while i would never you know like we said voting based on the prompt is silly i do think it's always a sign of a good story to take all the information that you've got and use it in a good way and childhood's end uses that prompt to inform the way we look at gaining a cutie mark right um and i thought that was interesting personally i I agree with you there the one thing that i disliked about the story was the ending because um i think the story would have done much much better if it if it gave us a detail that made it explicitly clear what firecracker's talent is but we don't really get that um at least i didn't think i read it a couple I went through it a couple times trying to find the detail, but it just was not there. I couldn't figure out what his talent was, and it's such an important detail in the story that you'd think you'd figure out what it is, but you don't. I, um, I think I'd got sort of the perception that it was something to do I thought it with had something to do with like making compassion. memories, maybe. Because I thought I thought it was like making like memories that you love or something like that. But it, it feels like the author of it tried to like give that one zinger. With making the scrapbook the same book that's on his his, his mark, mm. but it doesn't quite tie together. Yeah, um, I, I and see I, what you mean. 
it's it feels like it's missing just one detail that would that would make it totally clear. I wish I could say what it is, but because I don't know what the talent is, I can't really comment on how to make it more clear what the talent is. Uh, yeah, fair um, enough. So, so the fact that the ending just didn't quite come together for me really hurt that one for me. Also, I just this one just came to me. Are you good with Childhood's End? Anything else you want to say about that one? Um, I'm happy. You go ahead. One last thing. I totally forgot about it until like just now. I want to give a special shout out to, to I'm probably going to butcher this. Bonatinum Doce May, I think it is. That's about right, yeah. Uh, Bonatinum I don't know. Doce May or Doce I don't, I don't know Latin. I think it's Latin, not Italian. Look, the point is, this story was good. Um, it's, it's, it felt like it could have been an episode almost. Although at the near the end, it does get a little bit darker. Maybe not darker, but more mature. Because did you read it? I didn't, did not. That's one of the four I haven't touched oh my yet, God. I'm afraid. It's so good. It's. It, I think it's in my top five. It's It's a little bit more mature than an episode of the show near the end, but it's so good. It tugs at your heartstrings in all the right places, and it's absolutely fantastic. If if anyone you know listening to this is, is kind of into um, more character-driven dramas like I am, I think you're going to love, love uh, Bonatinum Do, Doce, Doce May. Hmm. It's I I because I don't want to spoil it if you haven't if you haven't read it because the the end is really like a zing, um or at least some of the lines near the end um because it's the basic concept is that Charlie's going to move away uh, to to get a doctorate and Diamond Tiara takes it especially hard and there are some real real big lines near the end that absolutely broke my heart in a very good way, um but yeah. That story is absolutely fantastic, and I recommend that everyone read it if character drama is your thing. And for um, anyone who's interested, uh, the title translates to "Teach Me Goodness." I don't know if anyone's said that in the comments, but I've just looked it up. It's um, well, it's mentioned in the story. Good, good. Um, which is which is nice. <laughs> yes, it's a great story. Before we finish, I just want to throw out one quick shout out to uh, He Come to Town, uh, just for being a phenomenal piece of fan service. There's nothing else huh, I want yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah. That was just pure fan service, and I loved it. It's yeah, that that one was funny. I liked it. It definitely wasn't my favorite comedy of the round, um, but yeah, it's it's pretty good. It made me squeal a few times with happiness, and oh, yeah. that's all I yeah, really yeah. wanted. Um, so I guess that wraps us up. I guess that's it. Well done, us. Um, so thank you, for, thank you everyone for listening. And from here, of course, from thank us you here at Radio Write Off. Uh, we wish you a good rest of day. Given we have absolutely no idea what time you're listening to this.